All right, caller, you're live on the air. Please tell us your name. Where are you calling from? Hello, my name is Josh. Uh, I'm a Christian calling from England. Welcome, um, Josh. Apparently, I'm studying the Jewish objections to uh, the, the Christian faith seriously, and I appreciate the rabbis, uh, Rabbi Tobia Singer's argument, arguments, uh, and I find many of them very interesting and worth considering. Uh, however, I have some difficulty reading with a rabbi when, in regards to the accusation that Christians are idolaters, uh, simply because they believe that Yeshua is divine and the Trinity. And, and that is because if you ask any Christian uh, whether they believe in, in more than one God, they do affirm that they do honestly and genuinely believe in one God. The Trinity, whether right or wrong, whether it is correct or wrong uh, or, or, or right, uh, it is simply a description of God's nature from their point of view. It's a God consisting of uh, uh, hypostasis in, in Greek, and, or, or this is the pers persons, uh, the Trinity, or the Aramaic Knuma. Um, you know, just like in Kabbalah, we we read uh, you know descriptions of uh, a description of God's nature in in a form of ten sferot. Um, so, so the rabbi also quotes. Uh, from the Tanakh, where it says, "Begam Netzach Israel lo yishaker velo yinachem ki lo adam hu li nachem." So, so Christians do look at this verse like God is not a man to lie. They don't see that God is a man. They see that God took on a human nature, and that verse is not to tell us what is the nature of God. It is to tell us that God is not like any human being to, that that he lies. So the purpose of it is not to des to describe God's nature. But still, Christians do not believe God is a man, that God just simply took on a human nature. So my question to you, how would you respond to this? Uh, I find it, I don't agree with you when you say that uh, Christians are idolaters because they have these beliefs, because they genuinely do not believe God is more than one God. And they don't just believe in more than one God, they do believe in one God. Don't, don't hang up, please, if you wouldn't mind, don't hang up. Sure. I find you very interesting. And I'm really very grateful to you for calling in and asking a question with so much honesty and kind of like leaving yourself vulnerable to ask such a question. It's very, very thoughtful. And I'd like to walk this through together with you, if I may. Sure. If I may. I just want to walk this through with you. You said that all Christians, if asked, would say that I believe only in one God. And of course we agree. All Christians would say they believe in one God. And they would say that because the Torah says so in Deuteronomy 6, 4 and so many other places, right? So the moment a Christian says that I believe in two gods or three gods, so that means that's, that would be a heresy. And no Christian, unless they were Marcionites, but they are, these are outliers, forget about them, they don't exist anymore, or Gnostic Christians, but all Christians would say they believe in one God, right? So we're in agreement with that. But then words are introduced by Christians, such as, and I want to work this through with you, such as, there are persons. Now, in ordinary conversational language, we're using this term person in a way that no one ever used the term person. Like, in conventional conversational English, that's not what Christians mean when they say person, that there are three persons. Like, what do you mean? Now, I'm not asking you to answer that question. Now, this is not like a trick question. I'm just expressing what is obvious is that when Christians use the term three persons, they don't mean three persons like there are three people in the room. They're using a word in a completely unconventional way. And when you use language in an unconventional way that lacks the conventional meaning, there's no way to to engage it because it doesn't mean what it conventionally means. Or hypostatic union. These are terms that you alluded to or referred to. I'm not setting up a straw man. You're using a term that's not conventional. And I'm suggesting that the church had to come up with these terms because the whole thing is false, and ultimately the church would concede it's a mystery which is unfathomable, but it is a contradiction. If there really is only one God in Christian theology, and simply God became flesh, which means it's a mode, and just like I am a father, I am, I am also a son, 
I'm also a brother, and I am. I'm all of those things, but I'm the same person. If that, that, see, that's very plain English. So that's Sibelianism. That's modalism. That's a ideology, which, a, a Christology, which the church rejects as utter heresy. And frankly, it's not consistent with the Christian Bible because in the Christian Bible, Jesus is asking, I mean, if Jesus is God in the flesh, if he is, then why did he say, my God, my God, why did you forsake me? Who was he talking to? Who was he asking that question? If, as you say, Jesus was simply God in the flesh. What I'm doing here is I'm just using very simple phrases, very simple English, because I, I, I don't want to mask anything with terms that no one's ever heard of. Why would Jesus not know in Mark 13 when asked, when is the time of the second coming? And he responds, of that day, that hour, knoweth no one. The Son doesn't know, the angels don't know, only God, the Father knows. If Jesus was God, how could he not not have the information, the knowledge, the mind of God. So the Christian Bible screams, let me just for a moment, that Jesus is subordinate to the Father, and I can give you endless other examples. And therefore, I would posit to you that the church, this is where I'm going with all this. I want you to respond to this, or just, or say I want to think about it, or whatever you'd like to. Therefore, the church has a contradiction, and it has to solve this by coming up with this weird language. Forget Kabbalistic stuff. I want to deal with Tanakh. Jesus can't be God because he's praying to him. He's talking to him. He's begging God, take this cup not of my will, but of your will right before the crucifixion. How could they have different wills? So therefore, you have to have this kind of weird language that no one uses. This is why this is impossible. Go ahead. Does that make any sense to you? Yeah. Yeah, does, yeah. Does it, it totally does makes it sense. Does it resonate uh, for you? From, from, of course, I understand your perspective. And I, as I said, I am seriously taking the objections. And I, I have some problems with the text um, in general. Um, my My question isn't whether the trinity or the divinity of uh, Jesus uh, makes sense or is consistent or it is explainable because Christians do have answers such as like the, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the second person or uh, hypostasis of the, of the trinity limited himself, took on human flesh, including human mind, human spirit, and so he was fully human. I'm not trying to explain it to you. I know that you know it. Stay with what you believe in. I apologize. But let's, first of all, let's, one thing, let's both use conventional language, if I may. I'm with you. I like you a lot. I want to stay in touch with you. I'm not, I'm not patronizing you. I really, really appreciate this conversation. But go with it. I don't think my point completely reached you. Um, if you... Just give me one, uh, just half a, half a minute. And Go for the it. point is, I'm not trying to justify the Trinity or the divinity. I'm saying that Christians do have answers. And after giving those answers, they are wholly and completely and genuinely convinced God is one. It, it's just that God's nature is too complex and it's very difficult to explain. And they try to philosoph philosophize. My problem is that um, you, Rabbi, um, in many cases accuse Christians of being idolaters. Yes. Uh, that, uh, as opposed to the Muslims who, who are Unitarians, who do have yes. possibly Khalid Ba'ulam Abba because they worship one God, part of the seven Noahide law, but Christians are completely lost because they're idolaters. I, I don't agree with you on this. So let me ask you a question. I don't want to work outside of your framework. If Christians worship Jesus as God, right? And he's not God, and he's not God. He's not the creator of the heavens and the earth. Is that idolatry? Even from a Christian viewpoint, the answer is yes. Every Christian would say. I don't, I don't think so, uh, because it's, it's how they view God being revealing himself, such as Muslims believe in Allah, 
and Allah has specific attributes that are really different. I studied Islam, I know Arabic fluently. Allah is very different from Hashem. Very, very different in terms of this, his attributes. Could, could we like not put Muslims in this for a moment? Because I just want to, or else we're going to get go off the rails. Let's just, just let's just stay focused on this for a moment. A Christian, if he worships Jesus God and Jesus not God, that would be foreign worship, which is exactly what Avodah Zarah means, right? Right. Yeah. I think that's right. You would agree with that, right? Mm-hmm. Now, one other question. Could you tell me of a religion that doesn't have answers? I don't know of one. The Church of the Latter-day Saints, as an example, they don't have apologetics at Brigham Young University. They have a fantastic section in their studies at Brigham Young of studying apologetics. Mm -hmm. Does the Roman Catholic Church not have answers? When you ask Eastern Orthodox Christians, why do you venerate icons of the church, which is prohibited in the Torah? They don't have apologetics. They don't have answers. When you ask Roman Catholics, why do you have statues in your churches? They all have answers. All religions have apologetics, have a defense. Mm -hmm. Here's what I would suggest to you, that the claim that Jesus was God— is a fantastic claim. This is not the claim that when I was a child, I had a pet turtle. And you'd probably believe me because it's, it's very common. The claim that Jesus was God, that the Messiah was God, I'm not going to go into the Eucharist, not going to go die for our sins, second coming, I want to just leave, and I really want to leave Muslims out of it. I just don't want to be diverted. All would agree this is a fantastic claim. And fantastic claims need more than thin, torturous evidence and responses. So the fact that they have answers, as you say, in no way ameliorates the problem. The problem is very grave because this is a, an extraordinary claim which is opposed by the plain language of Tanakh. God says, Anoichi el v'loyish, Hosea 11.9. I am God, and I'm not a man. So no matter what you think, whether God could come as a man or not, the prophets of Israel came to dissuade us from ever believing that, whether philosophically we could believe this or not. So I want to say to you that the fact that Christians have answers in no way even begins to explain away this monumental problem, because all religions, Mormons as an example, a young religion, they have answers to all the questions. But when you take the problems and the enormity of the claims, and then you look at the answers, the question is, does the answer measure up to the claim? And the answer has to be no. And therefore, Christians need to re- reconsider this whole thing. And, and I thank you very much for joining me on here. I really do. I think you're a very thoughtful person. And Christians really do think about these things, and they're caught in a conundrum. And I think that when you press a Christian far enough, they ultimately will concede that this is a mystery. What does that mean? It's a surrender. It can't be explained. Why not? Just in summing this up, if we look at Tanakh, which describes the nature of God, what we find is uncomplex language, unsophisticated language. Ki anoichi el ve'ein oid elihim ve'efes kamaini, Isaiah 46, verse 9. Like, I am God alone, and there's nothing like me. Ein od milvado, there is no one else. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 35. What we would want to see is in the Jewish Bible, is to say that there's one God, but he'll be manifested in three persons. That would be very persuasive, even though the word person doesn't mean anything. And this is why I kept you on, and thank you for joining me. But I wanted to make this point, which in all my years, William, I think you'll agree with me, we've never addressed this. Correct. And that is that Christians use weird language— unconventional, like person, is there a person in the living room? How many people are there in the kitchen? (laughs) 
I'm the only person in the room. Like, why does did the church have to just use this specialized language which doesn't apply in any other realm? Hypostatic union. Like, why do we need to use weird words that no one ever heard of? Because these words mask the shell game that's going on. But to merely state that uh, Christians have answers, that Trinitarians have answers, that doesn't even begin to help the church. Because as it turns out, that is common to every religion. Every religion has a body of apologetics, a defense of their religion. And what we're always doing is we are measuring the the defense against the enormity of the claim, always, no matter, it's not, this is not only a religious issue. If I said that I had a pet turtle as a child, you probably would believe me. Why? Because it's, it's a very small claim. Kids frequently have pets. If I'm making claims about your eternal life, heaven and hell, Moreover, you love HaKadosh Baruch Hu, you love Hashem, and you want to be in a right relationship with Him, and you don't want to defile your intimate relationship with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And the church is making claims that a man came in the flesh as expressed in the prologue of John. That is a fantastic claim. A fantastic claim requires more than the sophistry of funny words that don't have any conventional meaning, that have weird meanings. And the fact that a religion has answers, I don't know of any religion, that, I don't know any religion that says, we don't have an answer. So they all do. But what we do is, well, how do you solve it then? Then what religion could be false if, if answers are the barometer for truth? The answer is that we always examine the enormity of the claim against with the evidence and with the church, the evidence that we are given is so torturous, is so thin that no sober mind can accept it. Thank you for your question. <music> 